Hi there, welcome to Design Spark Ask the Expert. Today I'm joined by Andrea Wanetti from ST Microelectronics, and we're here to talk about the world of MEMS sensing applications and products. Hi Andrea, welcome to Design Spark. Thank you, it's really a pleasure. Second time here with, uh, with you. Let's go and let's see how we can make it exciting our future. So the last time we were together was way back in 2019. When I say way back, I'm, I'm saying that because between now and then, obviously there's been a lot of change in the world. There's been the pandemic, there's a lot of stuff ongoing at the moment. So it does seem quite a, a long time ago, but in the world of technology, four years is a, a long time anyway. You know, back in 2019, we were talking about where MEMS were being used. We were talking a lot about predictive maintenance and condition monitoring. So what, what's moved on both in this perspective of maybe product developments from ST's point of view, but also in terms of what users are looking for out of technology. You know, if we think about things around net zero, for example, all of that is in the forefront of, of users. So do you want to just bring us up to date from your point of view? Yeah, so I think that yeah, you're told right. Uh, four years uh, and mainly these uh, four years is uh, really a, a major, major long time spot. If we consider where we, we were in 2019 and also the awareness uh, of the people about uh, uh, problems, uh, it was not uh, the same as today. Uh, we went through the, the COVID, we went through the pandemic, but mainly in the, in, in the past few years, there was uh, a much more stringent need and awareness for everyone to contribute to the health of the planet. Mm -hmm. Altogether, we know that we needed to go to net zero emission by 2050. It seems uh, a, a long, uh, long journey, but practically we needed to act today. And this is something that uh, everyone is starting to, to consider important. But sometimes, uh, uh, even if it's important, it's not clear to everybody that we need to go through a journey. Mm -hmm that implies uh, to move uh, from the total consumption of uh, energy and electricity as per today, that is 22 terawatt per hour, to something like three times more in order to go to zero net emission. Mm -hmm. It's something that is absolutely counterintuitive. So I needed to consume more, basically to be safe. Yeah. And this is something that uh, it will be done by using completely different uh, energy contributors. And so moving from uh, fossil, uh, from cork, from oil to something that is green, mm -hmm. wind, solar. But uh, this will go through something that uh, it will make uh, all uh, the different infrastructure with the absolute need to be more efficient, to be more efficient, to be more monitored, mm -hmm. to be more uh, sensorized in order to try to do more yeah. with less. It, it means that we'll use definitely much, much more silicon and much more MEMS silicon in order to go through this journey. Yeah. So basically to make it simple, in the past four years, people started to get aware that silicon exists. There was the shortage. <laughs> yeah. Now silicon exists, but the silicon will become one of the major enablers of our journey to a more healthy planet. Mm -hmm. And this is a major change that for sure happens uh, so far. Yeah. So I think that's really interesting in, in what you were saying there, because I see that the role of sensors as the the gateway to actually get to where we need to be. So what, what is it that you think, just if we expand a little bit more on the roles of sensors per se, but also the capabilities that they need to deliver to, to help us get on that journey? We wanted to have technology that we, we mentioned it needs to be sustainable. Yeah. But on the other side, we need the technology that need to be human centered. If in this moment uh, uh, we see uh, the sensor are now really at the center of the human being uh, interactions. And if we go through a little bit of uh, history, uh, the, the sensor and mainly the, the MEM sensor made a major change in the past uh, 20 years. 
we started to see in the beginning of year 2000 the usage of, uh, of MAM sensor in order to change the user interface. At the time, we could say that we were in the so-called uh, offline era. Mm -hmm. I was using uh, my, my sensor in order to modify the interaction with my remote control. Let's not forget uh, the, the Wii at the, at the early stage, yeah. when we got to the first inertial sensor inside. But at the time, we were using even the sensor in the phone just to change from portrait to landscape uh, the screen or even in, in the car, you know, that we have uh, just uh, simple switches for airbag. Yes, yeah, yeah. no. I could say it was the offline era because the sensors were not really connected to anything. They were just the enable of the device, they were inside the device, and they were appreciated just uh, to change, uh, to have the technology change in the user interface. Then there was uh, in, in the past, uh, in the next 10 years, uh, so from since 2010 till 2020, a major change. We were moving from the offline era to what we could say is it was the online era. What it means, I have more sensors, I have more sensors inside any single device. It was important to have, of course, uh, more performances accuracy. Mm -hmm. I started to have the need to, to fuse the sensor in order to try to extract information. Yeah. And last but not least, I started to have sensors that were important because they were connected to the cloud. I am always uh, smiling when I was recalling in 2015 uh, the advent of the so-called Pokemon Go where my kid was saying, oh, I like that phone because there, are, there is a gyroscope there. No. I said, come on, how you, do you know there is a gyroscope inside the phone? Because it's enabling the geolocalization. At the time, it was a game that was used as a that's trial right. That's right. in order to see how accurate, how possible was the geolocalization with a massive use of, of different uh, customers. But it was for the first time the fact that we got the awareness that it was important not just because the sensor they were in enabling the devices, because the connection sensor, the fusion sensor connected to the cloud was started to enable service. Yes. Then there was another change because we moved in the past uh, two years to what uh, we call uh, the on life year. There is not any longer a distinction in between to be offline and online. We wanted to have the device that, because we are sensing, they are immediately, immediately giving us back something, a reaction, a service, and something that needs to be uh, in a condition always on. Mm -hmm. It was possible by putting intelligence inside the sensor, and that intelligence uh, was enabling the concept of the smart sensor. Now we need to make one step beyond because we need not just to be on life, we need to be sustainable on life. Mm -hmm. So we need to have sensors who have intelligence on board, who have intelligence that anyway will not wake up the, the cloud or the gateway to the yeah. cloud anytime. Because one thing that we need to get uh, real uh, clear on top of our head Sensor is data extraction. Data extraction is something that uh, if needs to be polished or needs to get a reaction implies to have data transmission to the cloud. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we think uh, that this world will be heavily sensorized. If, if there will be just a raw data transmission from each node to the cloud, will make basically this uh, world unsustainable. So we needed to move to the so-called so sustainable life by having sensors that instead of to be just smart and sending raw data, will be so smart to be sustainable and moving from raw data to yeah. meaningful data. Right, okay. So starting to make some computation really in the edge and to send just what we need, the minimum information mm -hmm. that will be also good in terms of privacy in terms of uh, overall uh, power consumption. 
and the three magic words that at the end we need to have for this sustainable life is to have something in terms of technology that will be accurate, smart, mm -hmm. and last but not least, open. Yeah. Because this will be possible if we will be a contribution not just from the, te from the technology providers, from, but from each of us that are playing with this technology that needs to be available yeah. right away to everybody. Yeah. So what you said right at the, 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 the beginning there was the interaction with MEMS in our world. Um, for example, people are interacting with sensors on a daily basis that they probably don't even realize. You know, when you were talking about the phone from landscape to portrait, the Pokemon Go example. But you guys are developing um, machine learning core with a, an intelligent uh, process and sensing unit. What is it that you're, you're looking to do with that product, maybe in terms of applications and potential applications, or is the more information you can give me about how that all kind of, which we alluded to, in the place together in terms of getting the right data at the right time? Yes, so in, in the sensor, and here when we are talking about uh, sensor, I, I don't have any distinction. MAMS is whatever who is really built up in uh, 3D. Is a different usage of silicon that is quite quite uh, uh, unique and peculiar. I could have uh, inertial sensor, I could have uh, pressure sensor. There is a, a lot of different things that anyway needs to be smart. Mm -hmm. And to be smart implies that you need to have inside uh, some uh, digital resources that have different capabilities. Machine learning core is of course one of those because uh, one thing that uh, uh, sometimes we give for, uh, for granted, uh, you are making silicon, so the technology is just, uh, is just in silicon. We forget that behind us there is one of the most pervasive technology that is across all the domain, that is uh, the artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. So you need to be able to uh, exploit the capabilities of AI inside the sensor by having different uh, flavor of implementation that allow the possibility for everyone to take advantage and to put the hands on. Machine Learning Core is one of uh, the typical example where we have been able to have uh, capabilities of implementation inside uh, the, uh, the sensor itself that is uh, quite, quite uh, compelling in terms of power consumption. You can have uh, uh, sensor that are able to learn mm -hmm. and are able to learn and make easier some uh, level of implementation once more by considering the power budget and the data transmission one of the key uh, goals that we needed to get achieved. Here I have uh, examples. We, I was mentioning we want to be sustainable but on the other side uh, we wanted to get served by the technology mm -hmm. and I have one one simple uh, example in front of us. We have a PC. The PC, I want to, to close the PC because I'm sustainable. Immediately, I want to get the, the power cut off. But because uh, I want to get served, at the moment that I reopen the PC, I want immediately to immediately. get the service. So if I really want to be sustainable, I needed to make uh, my device be so intelligent to understand if uh, it's on the table, so it can be reactivated immediately, or it's put in a bag, so that I can cut off the power without having problem. Sustainability mm -hmm. on top of my head. So if I'm doing by not having really a smart sensor with uh, AI in the edge, with machine learning core there, mm -hmm. I need to get this information polished and processed by the cloud. So in order to do just this simple feature, and if I'm not doing in the edge, I need to get processed. And you know how much CO2 you are going to waste per year to do just this simple distinction? Mm -hmm. 70k tons of CO2. Wow. So if you do in the edge, if each of the PC is uh, enabled like that, we yeah. have uh, recently one uh, very good uh, advertisement cooperation that we did with HP yeah. about that. You have the possibility to get served, so human-centered technology that can help you, 
but you can be sustainable at the same. Yeah. There is a, another way of implementation where you can have more possibility even of uh, enable different ways uh, of, of business model as well, that by putting some specific uh, D customized DSP, what we call the ISPU, so Intelligent Sensor Process Unit. In that case, you have the capability really to run uh, algorithms. Algorithms that might come from every single contributor here. Yeah. Uh, with uh, the capability, of course, to have uh, a lot of uh, support uh, being very flexible in terms of tools and AI tools that can be used. And in that case, uh, you can even achieve much more, uh, uh, let me say, power consumption uh, improvement yeah. here. Well, here we add uh, back to what you were mentioning as far as uh, conditional monitoring and support. We have uh, a very good cooperation with uh, a company like SPM in this field that by using the SPU, ISPU has been able really to achieve very strong performance, very, very low power. The ISPU implementation is something that also we advertised uh, almost two years ago being the, mm, the first one really available in the market in order to, to run uh, tiny ML. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is something that uh, where we are even looking after to have more and more benchmark yeah. from the tiny ML community in order to see how uh -huh. we can have in the inertial yeah. more and more contribution. Yeah, I think that's, in, ter in terms of my thinking of um, the edge and uh, IoT, what you're saying now with the, the edge is, is actually the sensor now. Um, you can't really get much closer to the edge than that, can you? But some of those applications that you were talking about, um, that really is forward thinking in, in terms of closing the laptop when you're on the desk, open, power up. But when you put it in your, in your bag to go on the train, for example, powers down. So I think in terms of the, the application, I think that's one that everybody could probably understand and as we move further forward, there's going to be a lot more applications in this, this technology. And with that, I just want to ask you, in, in terms of the products and the applications, what is it that you guys are really focusing on? Okay, we are really uh, playing across all the, different, uh, all the different domains because uh, in this area, uh, as I was, uh, was saying in my, in my intro, sky is the limit. If we want, uh, we want really to achieve uh, a global sensorization, mm -hmm. I cannot stop myself to the industrial or to the personal electronics or in automotive, any kind of, uh, let me say, different implementation can enable new ideas. That's the reason why I was saying we need not just to have a technology that gives you the possibility to have uh, uh, of very crisp data that doesn't need to be polished. Mm -hmm. Fine, it's very good, It'll give you an advantage. You don't need just to have a digital implementation by having resources that can help you in order to process locally in the edge. But if we really, we want to have a massive usage of the technology for everyone's, let me say, contribution and even interest to play with it. We need to leave it open. Mm -hmm. So one thing that is, uh, is also key is to have the possibility for the sensor, and what ST sensors are often now, is to have the possibility for everyone to get access to those digital resources. Yeah. So I have uh, uh, NAI DSP, I have the MLC inside the sensor. You are having, for instance, another sensor and you are not ST. You have a digital output, you can go and connect to our sensor that is becoming a hub. Mm -hmm. And after that is helping you to process right. what, uh, yeah. what it could be needed. And then you have even the access to the ST ecosystem because yeah. the driver of uh, ST sensor allow you to go up uh -huh. to, to the gateway, to the cloud. 
and even one thing that sometimes we are missing. A sensor is done by two, two portions of silicon. One is the mechanical part, uh, the MEMS per se. Mm -hmm. And the other one is uh, the ASIC. They usually is done with uh, a technology that is quite, quite compelling in terms of analog. In order to extract and to read the capacitance or to read uh, a piezo resistor mm -hmm. or a current, you need to have a very good analog uh, uh, front end. Yeah. What we are doing now uh, is uh, to exploit even more the consumer to be open by offering also in the same sensor the capability of an extra analog front end that allow you if you are not digital and maybe you are another sensor that is just in analog to go knock the door yeah. and to get processed by the same uh, uh, digital resources that are embedded in, in the ST sensor. So one thing that you, we are starting to really to offer is the concept to be a real hub mm -hmm. to get uh, the possibility for the system to yeah. take advantage of what is, is there. I don't have, uh, I'm not so, let me say, bullish to say that I can cover any kind of application in terms of sensorization and we know that will, will happen. Yeah but I can be the servant of the system mm -hmm. that allow you to play uh, on the digital resources that are embedded and to, to go and uh, exploit what is, is needed going up to the cloud. Yeah. So what you're saying there, you're really creating an environment for design engineers, which is, is open, they can go to design and they can explore to you know, their, their latest applications, but I think out of what you're just telling me, there will be a lot more coming through w within that environment because you people have different ideas about what they need mm -hmm. and you'll have a, a, a kind of like community, for example, where they can go design and explore. I just want to go back slightly to, um, we were talking about sustainability a little bit earlier and um, probably one of the, the most common sensors that people are, are aware of is, is the infrared sensing. So in, in terms of like sustainability, so we're, we're sitting in a nice office environment at the moment. You know, we've got nice air through, you know, the CO2 levels are quite nice, for example. Is there anything happening within IR? You know, for example, with, um, you would have uh, people monitoring, for example, and you can then tell with your CO2 sensors that there's too many people, CO has gone up. Is there anything within IR which can help maybe with new newer applications towards that? Yeah, uh, here once more is MEMS is, uh, is coming to help. There is another MEMS technology that internally called uh, TMOS that at the end is an infrared sensor who has uh, uh, a, a major capability. So you have the, the possibility if you compare to the standard uh, PIR sensor mm -hmm really to operate at very, very low power, much lower than, than the standard PIR. So you have the possibility of to be always on, and this is something that can help also if you are thinking to be battery operated. On the other side, compared to the PIR, that is a, a pure uh, AC uh, sensor, here you have also the capability in infrared to detect also the DC. Mm -hmm. So we can solve the problem of, uh, of the toilet of the world because you can stay, you can even not move and the light is not cut off. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I've been there. Out, out of kidding, uh, one of the things that uh, can help, if you are going to equip to a sensor like that, just 10% of all the uh, office and all the, the building automation will be able to, 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 to support that. Mm -hmm. You can easily save, once more if I'm converting to CO2, 250 k tons of CO2 per year, mm -hmm. just because you are detecting if uh, people is, uh, is inside or not. And uh, this is something that can uh, make, uh, uh, by having an immediate uh, light cut off, an enormous saving. Here, once more, is availability of sensor, is availability of sensor that after that can be supported by artificial intelligence and by having afterwards the possibility to be open anyone on each vertical can go and contribute mm -hmm. and this is let me say the message that is coming in, in the past four years you are called to contributing 
because the environment, the technology is calling you because it's open. Yeah. So one of the things as well in, in terms of um, development, um, I just wonder if, if we look at the inertial sensor modules and adaptive self-configuration plus sensor fusion, we bring this all together. What is it you can tell me about that? We made the moving uh, uh, from the on life to the, to the sustainable on life. We made one, one change. Before the sensor has been uh, required to be always on. Fine, so I'm there, I'm doing my job. I'm very, very, let me say, uh, capable to not consume other than the minimum. Mm -hmm. But it's not enough. I wanted to have really to be capable, to be sustainable, and to do just uh, who, something when it is required. So we are moving from the always on to the always aware. Yeah. So what it means uh, that uh, the sensor is really sleeping by having uh, few, few uh, resources that are on. And just at the moment that the one event is triggering, you are starting to switch on the resources that are required and to start to classify the event without waking up either the microcontroller or the application processor or whatever is going to the getaway. So you are doing really in the edge. Right. And then by, by having the possibility to classify the event, you are even able to reprogram yourself in order to have the possibility to be more efficient, mm -hmm. really in the edge. And this is something that is a principle of the always awareness that is becoming key if, we, if you want to offer a new wave of sensor in the market. Last but not least, what we decide to do is also, uh, thanks to the possibility of integration that the ASIC technology can offer to us, so not just a technology that is capable of an analog, as per what I was mentioning before, but also a technology that is capable in order to host a digital density mm -hmm. that is good enough uh, to put inside a sense of fusion super low power so that you can have in the sensor, in the inertial sensor, the capability to run already a sense of fusion that is hardwired, but is already fully certified and extensively used also in the personal electronics by big, big player, in order once more to be very, very efficient uh, in, in terms of power consumption. If I'm making a comparison versus uh, or what we have today in the inertial sensor uh, versus solution where you have uh, uh, an MCU such as a Cortex M4 running the same sensor fusion, you can save something like 50%. Right. So it's we are really moving on the right direction to yeah, be yeah. really super, super low power in the edge, and at the end it means uh, sustainable. Uh, and, that, <laughs> and that's quite substantial, actually, you know, yeah. when you're talking 50%. So you, when you were talking about always aware, um, the, the market obviously in wearables and sensing technologies used in wearables, that, that, that's really kind of growing. So that always um, aware f functionality, what are the, the major product developments or applications where you know these will actually be used okay uh, first let me uh, give uh, another uh, brief introduction the new generation of sensor what ST is calling generation free is uh, not any longer offering uh, single product it is offering a sort of platforms so when I'm talking about I'm offering you a generation free accelerometer, frankly speaking, I give you a platform and you can play inside the platform according to the need of the different uh, applications that you needed to take on. Uh, same accelerometer, same on the six axis IMU, same on the pressure sensor that maybe we can, uh, we can look at after. Let's take the, the following your question, the accelerometer. I have the platform of accelerometer super, super low power. So for, for the first time, if I'm using the basic accelerometer, I have the capability 
to put, uh, for instance, uh, the same stuff uh, in applications such as uh, hearing aids mm -hmm. that before were not even uh, uh, having considered because the power consumption was not uh, was not substantially adequate to to what the needs of the application. But then, if I'm capable to use in the hearing aids, I have the possibility, of course, to to expand in what it could be, uh, for instance, application like uh, uh, health monitoring or fitness monitoring. Mm -hmm. And the same uh, accelerometer, by putting um, in a platform the possibility to enable all the digital resources that are there, I have a classifier, MLC inside, that helped me really to be very, very efficient in defining what are the different uh, activity right that i i'm uh, actually acting i'm doing and to provide information in order to have a very strong uh, fitness device mm -hmm. super super low power so that the battery can last uh, very long but if i'm making one step beyond so i was mentioning but i have the possibility even to have an external analog from 10 that can help that can go back and forth so it means that i can have something that can go in but I have also the possibility to extract the data, for instance, and in putting outside uh, some electrodes. And here, for instance, we have uh, what we call QVAR, the capability of detection yeah. uh, of uh, the change yeah. of charge. That is something that is uh, very, very common. But if I have uh, uh, two electrodes that uh, are detecting that specific uh, changes, by using AI, by using the fusion, I have the possibility in the same device maybe to start to detect proximity or to detect swiping mm -hmm. or to detect uh, long press yeah, yeah. that are things that the accelerometer per se cannot do. Mm -hmm. So once more, we have capabilities uh, uh, that are based on the fact that the sensor is more accurate, uh, is uh, less consuming, but that you can expand. Yeah by using the AI technology and the, the augmentation that you have by putting some additional features uh, around. Yeah, I think um, you mentioned QVAR there, so, um, and the, the proximity. Uh, so if I think of like my earbuds and I take them out, I, at the moment they're still playing. Essentially what you're saying is I could take my earbuds out, doesn't, it recognizes that they are no longer in the ear and they will turn off. So one of the other things I want to talk about um, is true wireless stereo. And I think th there's quite a few applications here which I think are going to improve the performance and obviously the user experience. So we think about things like bone conduction. What is it you can tell me about true wireless stereo? The, the true wireless stereo is of course one of the devices that is expected to grow in, in, the, next, uh, in the next future. Uh, one of the, of the magic words that has been also, I could say, abused in the past few years was uh, the metaverse. But metaverse, at the end, what it means, we needed to create uh, an avatar mm -hmm. somewhere and as our first duty regardless what the avatar has to do, <laughs> is to populate the avatar. Mm -hmm. And how you populate the avatar? Mainly by using the device that you are having uh, with you. And as you mentioned, one is could be the, the wearable. I can have maybe two wearable instead of one so that I can track the mm -hmm. movement of the arms. But then absolutely what will be key is the T TWS because all the movement of the head all the possibility of detect what you are doing is done through the TWS. Yeah. So for sure, regardless metaverse we fly or not, <laughs> but the TWS will become one of the major devices that will assist us. Yeah. Also because uh, through the year you can extract a lot of biometric information. So it's not just for audio, it's something that is going beyond the audio. And what you want to take advantage from there is the fact that the TWS can be heavily sensorized. If we compare one smartphone 
and one pair of TWS, the number of uh, sensors is basically multiplied by a factor to the five. What you have inside, of course, uh, on top of microphones, uh, but you have uh, uh, or an accelerometer, mm -hmm. for tap tap, because you want to switch on, switch off. You wanted to have uh, a gyroscope at the moment that you needed to track the rotation of your head. It will be important also for 3D audio application. Yes. But last, last but not least, for intelligibility. You can have the, for free the possibility of uh, detect what your bone and is going to tell you in a much <laughs> more precise way yeah. rather than what you can capture from the microphone. Yeah. What is unbelievable is that uh, usually if we forget for a while uh, the, the, the microphones, usually you are having uh, a significant number of components that we are composing the application. Today, in one single IMU, you have the possibility, six axis IMU, you have the possibility to have the accelerometer with uh, extended bandwidth for, for bone conduction, or very, very low power six, uh, gyroscope. Mm -hmm. You have the capability, of course, uh, to put inside uh, all uh, the AI and uh, uh, sensor fusion low power. You have the capability on top, the augment with the external channel, the possibility to put electrodes. And then to have, uh, the, of course, uh, the augmentation that you can have by having a proximity sensor that is mm -hmm. integrated in the same footprint that today is a 2.5 times 3 millimeter. Yeah. A lot of things that can come in a single component that needs to be as thin as possible because we as human center we want to have a battery of life that exactly. will not bother us in yeah. order to recharge. But TWS is becoming really one of the most interesting piece of technology yeah. that can offer us a lot of uh, information. Yeah, when I was um, reading up before this interview, I, I was looking at TWS and bone conduction and, and I still have a problem trying to get my, my head around the idea that there's technology that knows that I'm about to speak and it's using, you know, the sensor, the bone conduction, and it knows when I'm ready to talk. Um, I, f I find it amazing, and I'm really looking forward to see what happens in that area. It's, at the end of the accelerometer, if we wanted to rephrase, is a microphone with a certain bandwidth without hole. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, immediately from this application, uh, someone else, looking at the, the same capability, they start to think, oh, but why not to put in a car? Because if there is uh, uh, the need to read and listen in a different way information in a very uh, harsh environment with dust, the accelerometer can be used. And uh, in the car now, what you are looking after is to try to listen uh, the road noise and to try to cancel. Mm -hmm. So we see immediately that the things are crossing the different applications. And what has been developed for TWS can move to the automotive and vice versa mm -hmm. can go maybe to industrial or whatever. It's really an amazing world where ideas uh, can yeah. be developed it's, and uh, cost fertilized it, very it, It's such an exciting time, absolutely. So one, one of the other things, you, you mentioned obviously generation free, um, your sensors. You also have pressure sensor in there. So if we think about things like maybe location tracking, I'm just thinking in, in, in my mind, pressure sensing, are you able to look at altitude, submersible underwater, and if you combine that maybe with, with GPS, you can get true location. Um, but are there any other uses, you know, like maybe for like sports activities or what, what more can you tell me about your pressure sensing? Pressure sensor, of course, is another uh, piece of technology that is becoming quite, quite, uh, quite important. Uh, before we were thinking and the barometer, uh, once more, just to, to, to track activities. Now for safety, and we know that uh, the E911 regulation in the US 
implied that we, you need to provide the, the location mm -hmm. at the moment of the emergency call, not just in terms of uh, X, Y, but also in terms of Z. Yeah. And you wanted to have uh, the possibility to provide uh, the information with uh, an accuracy uh, less of one meter, because you need to know from which floor uh, you are calling. So the, in the US there is uh, a certification that goes through uh, a provider that is NextNav. And once more, once you have that certification, you know that the sensor is capable of that specific uh, accuracy. Mm -hmm. That is uh, something that is uh, completely different than before, because uh, it means that you don't need just uh, to have that level of accuracy at time zero but also for uh, the overall lifetime of the device. Mm -hmm. That is something that is becoming much more uh, challenging in terms of capabilities. And here we talk about uh, another important uh, uh, area of, of discussion that maybe will enable new business model or new technical challenges to the on. What, how good is the calibration at time zero of your sensor? Mm -hmm and what will be possible in the future in terms of recalibration. And these are things that anyway, more people can put hands on and have the freedom to put hands on, more ideas can come. Back to the pressure sensor, uh, we have uh, uh, also the need to get this uh, sensor certified for uh, Wi-Fi 6-7, that is once more uh, localization information that can come in contribution to that. We see that due to the, this fact, the pressure sensors are becoming more and more pervasive. And this will help, of course, in terms of fusion to provide more and more information. Mm -hmm. Here we were talking about barometer, but uh, we know that we can have also possibilities to, to do the way in a different, in, with a different manner, consider that you can have also waterproof. Right pressure sensor that can offer mm -hmm. a lot of things more. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, altitude, submersible as well in the, okay, yeah, great. The, 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 I mean, the world of sensor and sensor applications is, is really great to, to explore with, um, with, with ST microelectronics. And you, you touched earlier about the use of uh, sensing capability within electric vehicles. So when we think about things like electric vehicles and autonomous driving, for example, um, your sensors will have a, a form for usefulness, safety, and probably sustainability in there. So what, what is it you see within the, maybe the EV and autonomous driving market where ST microelectronic sensors are gonna come into to play? The EV market uh, is, of course, uh, coming with, uh, let me say, a new, new wave of ideas. Mm -hmm. First of all, what we have, we have experienced is that uh, uh, for the first time, this is a market that uh, has been not uh, started uh, from the traditional player. We know that EV, by definition, is someone who, who started in, uh, in California. Mm -hmm and has been followed by, by Chinese, that are rebuilding completely also the way that the, the car architecture yeah. has been designed since type zero. Before we were going through some paradigmas, uh, we, we needed to go to the tier one, each of those was selling liability together with the function. Now it's becoming very much vertical mm -hmm. with complete different needs and needs of rebuilding completely even the, the, the zone of, of the car, the different domains, and even the usage of sensors. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, sensor in the car, we have clear on top of our head the fact that there are sensors for safety. And the sensor for safety, by definition, uh, the airbag, the airbag system, uh, we have uh, the sensor for safety that are uh, key in order to have uh, the electronic stability control that are in this moment uh, the, the, the basic features that are in, inside the car. 
you have a sensor that to do that needs to be accurate and needs to be absolutely reliable. On the other side, you have systems such as navigation mm -hmm. where you need that really to have not just the reliability, you need to have the accuracy. And uh, in the EV car, the, the way that the complete uh, car architecture has been designed, it started to put in and to question why to have two different systems, one for safety and one for uh, accuracy for navigation, mm -hmm. and why we don't rebuild the system in a different way. So the new challenge now for Senso is to put together safety and accuracy, mm -hmm. putting together in something that could be consistent in, in, uh, in that direction. If I'm on the EV that is changing the business model, I put here also the interesting uh, add-on of the autonomous driving, you are asking of our accuracy level yeah. that is by far higher. Mm -hmm. And here uh, is, uh, is something that is uh, quite, quite interesting because uh, what you are required to, to do for systems that are L4 and above is basically to enable a function of a safe stop. Yeah. And the function of safe stop is, means that you need to be able to stop the car in 20 seconds without any assistance of GPS with an accuracy of 20 centimeters. That is basically what you are required in a VR system, right. considering also the very stressful environment due to the temperature in order not to have any drift. Mm -hmm. But it's the same need that you have in some application of uh, industrial monitoring to have the right level of control of the motor. Yeah. Last but not least, this requirement is equivalent to what you have on a tactical grade missile for military or aerospace application. But usually these systems are big like this cost a fortune <laughs> and are not uh, manufacturable with the right level of scalability inside yeah, the car. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So the MEMS technology needs to, to go in that direction and with the level of safety that is of course is required by systems like uh, ASLD. What we are doing also today is to start also on top of developing with uh, stretch of the accuracy of the technology with the support of also of the same concept as before, so to have more software capabilities, also to offer certified ASIL-B and ASIL-D software in order to start to enable the usage not just of the single component, but also the usage of a pair of component that allow you to get closer mm -hmm. to that level of uh, accuracy we're always considering that safety is, is the final target of the application. Uh, there is a lot, a lot of, uh, let me say, activities that is around the car. Last but not least, uh, we are not talking about just navigation and uh, safety. We consider that uh, uh, the car, I was mentioning before, human-centered technology, is becoming a sort of uh, a room extra room mm -hmm. where we wanted to go around. <laughs> so in terms of comfort, you are putting a lot, a lot of sensorization yeah. that make you difficult to understand if you are in the car or in your living room. So a lot of additional contribution for inertia sensor, pressure sensor, mm -hmm. and so on can help uh, in order to make the content of the automotive more and more richful of sensor, one must consider in the same, uh, the same needs. Yeah. Superpower consumption, AI, in order to assist classification capabilities that uh, can enable more and more in, yeah. uh, in the car itself. So is it interesting your, your understanding and, and take on the, the EV and the world of sensor with, with safety performance, but then also functionality? So. There's a, really a lot going on there that you know the consumer can get to grips with. But if I'm thinking in the consumer market as well, the, the consumers they, they, or the technology or the applications which are being driven in the consumer market demand more for less. 
So more functionality for less power usage, for example, and obviously when you're talking about scalability, things are getting a lot smaller. Where, where does that leave the world of, of MEMS? So you, you kind of mentioned there that MEMS is moving and will get there. What's your take on that? In the, in, uh, in the personal electronics, uh, the, everyone is trying, of course, to extract uh, information from their, from their devices. And this is something that uh, we know. We, we want uh, to move uh, from, from hardware to services. And in order to have uh, something that is definitely providing a, a better assistance to us. What it means uh, is that uh, anyway, uh, each consumer electronics manufacturer is now uh, putting devices that are getting better and better, that are capable to collect uh, data in order to try to classify better the, the, the way the consumer are using their devices. But at the end, they have also the same problem that we were mentioning before. We cannot just collect data and send the data to, to the cloud. They need to have the possibility just to, to sell to the customer the service without wasting uh, anyway uh, energy and without also touching what is also important, so the privacy of our data as well. We have seen that, for instance, uh, uh, in, by putting more and more MEMS sensor everywhere, I'm always thinking toothbrush, for instance. Mm -hmm. I have now wonderful uh, devices that allow you to understand how you are doing the job, how long, uh, assist you in, in a, at any means say, if your kid is not doing this and that. Mm -hmm. But you need to be sure that you are not every time selling all the raw data to the yeah, cloud yeah. just for just storage. Exactly. Yeah. And these are things that, that okay, I'm just, uh, if I'm considering my kid is, is using three minutes per day, but if all his data will be sent to the cloud every per year, there are once more something like 20 kilos of CO2. CO2 yeah. Why? Just that I need that, the information. Did you, go, did you do a good job? Yes. No. Mm -hmm. I need just one data. I don't need to have all my mouth uh, yeah. <laughs> well tracked uh, and so on. So yeah. these are things where really we need to work closely to the final device manufacturer in order to try to understand which are the needs, in order to help and vertical by vertical each one can go and contribute in order to provide the right assistance yeah. in the edge. Yeah, and I think this is a great example of what you, you, you were talking about technology versus sustainability. If you were to send all of that data all of the time in terms of CO2 level, it, it's huge. And um, I remember reading a couple of months back that if we all stopped replying to an email to say thank you to the person who sent you the first email, <laughs> the amount of CO2 that you save is amazing, yeah. So things like that really put put this into pers perspective. When we spoke in uh, 2019, we, we were talking a lot around predictive maintenance and obviously condition monitoring. A lot of what we're spoken about today um, is, is kind of fallen out of that area. That um, so we're, we're focused a lot on the commercial. Uh, sorry, the um, consumer market, we're focused a lot on the wearables, we're focused a lot on uh, EV. If we were just to step back into the industrial environment, for example, what do you think um, is going to be moving the way forward in terms of men's? What, what's the main driver within the industrial? I guess that we are on the continuing the journey that we started. Of course, the industrial market uh, is something that anyway is uh, is uh, moving with the good pace, but of course it's the pace of, uh, of the industrial market. So you cannot think that everything will be replaced uh, from one year to the other. We have seen uh, the adoption of a lot of lot of, uh, of system with more level of intelligence for predictive maintenance and conditional monitoring. We have seen that it is one of the most active uh, area of, uh, let me say, even innovation, because uh, in the 
industrial market, you need to try and uh, solve the problem of the early detection of uh, misworking of your system, not just by using the single sensor, mm -hmm. but maybe fusing information that are coming, oh, the ultrasound, uh, uh, information that I capture from an ultrasound microphone in combination with uh, some overheating on the temperature sensor mm -hmm. and the vibration of my just uh, two kilohertz uh, uh, accelerometer, all combined together can give me the information. Yeah. Here, what we have been uh, requested to develop, and the answer it was the ISPU that I was presenting before, is to let the people playing uh, with uh, uh, algorithms that are much more uh, customized to the different uh, equipment and machine. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we have the ISPU, so something that can work really in a very, very low power mode, it can uh, help in order to have uh, the possibility to use neural network uh, uh, and classification that is done uh, beyond the standard MLC is something that can help in order to make easier even the adoption of, uh, of sensor mm -hmm. by preserving vertical by vertical the customization level that anyway in a very fragmented world such as the industrial is uh, heavily required. Mm -hmm. But this is an area, once more, where um, innovation is, is, uh, is going fast and the cross fertilization across the different market, automotive and personal electronics, is, uh, is helped a lot. Yeah. Yeah, so I came across a, a really good um, analogy of how MEM sensors are actually working in the industrial world. And they were acoustic imaging cameras. And the, the strap line was, this is how you can see sound. So that is used in industrial maintenance for compressed air systems where there's leakage, for example. Um, and I thought that was really kind of a good analogy in, in terms of what it is that you can actually do with MEM sensing. Um, so the possibilities are, is, is huge. And with the possibilities being huge, what is it that ST offer users in terms of support, for example, if they want to you know, develop some of the applications, do you have support tools? And you mentioned obviously in environments and ecosystem. What is it you can tell me about that? For sure, ecosystem is, is, the, key, is the key word. Uh, when I was uh, going through the different uh, analog analogies in terms of timing, when we were talking about online, what it means that uh, no ecosystem, no possibility to take advantage of the sensors. Now you need to, to really to do a, a different things. You need to, to have more intelligence in the sensor. You need to, to, to have the capabilities to open the sensor really in the edge and to offer the access uh, to the ecosystem uh, to everyone. So that's uh, uh, what, what is really key is uh, to move from, uh, from the product, from the product to a platform. Mm -hmm and then through the platform with the ecosystem the, the possibility to open this platform to everybody. Mm -hmm. So the fact that uh, ST is not any longer offering features, tools, capabilities to develop on this tool, but really inviting others, competitors, mm -hmm. to look at uh, uh, what is uh, available and ready to be used is something that is becoming key. There is the need to move from what we call the, from a, a product, from a platform to a hub. Here is something that of course uh, is enabling a completely different uh, business model, completely different operating model, but is helping also the fact that there will be a level of creativity yeah. that had come out of that. Tools uh, is, of course, what uh, we, uh, are, uh, we are offering to everybody. And what, this is something that is uh, in continuity to what we were mentioning in 2019. What we are offering also in terms of availability of, uh, of tools or boards and whatever is really the top-notch technology. So there is no distinction 
in terms of what we are putting on our boards uh, versus what we are going to offer to the big OEM mm -hmm. across the world. So the top notch needs to be available to everyone, to the single developer, same as the big OEM at the same time. Because we don't see in this moment uh, the, the major difference in between uh, creativity right. in uh, the single contributor or in the big, big guy. Yeah. There is, uh, today there is so much need to put the ends on that uh, everybody in a world of yeah. 7 billion plus uh, uh, people we can find someone more intelligent than us everywhere, <laughs> for absolutely, sure. <laughs> absolutely. I, I like the way you, you kind of phrase that. Um, so if we go from the large to the small, the innovation is there and to give the users the ability to create that innovation, not just by using your products, but also giving them a support ecosystem, that can only be a, a good thing for future developments, I'm sure. We, uh, we have uh, boards, for instance, that are uh, of coming from our new generation uh, of MEMS, as we're saying. For the consumer, we have now just recently introduced the Sensortile uh, Box Pro, that is quite, quite, uh, quite new. And we are uh, still pushing uh, for industrial the STWIN uh, dot box. Once more, why the concept of the box? Because uh, I don't ask you to be uh, sometimes uh, the electronic engineer that needs to, to put really and to put your, mm -hmm. uh, his thinking also on, on the pure hardware. There are several levels of, uh, of, let me say, of programming. But you can have also the luxury not to, to, to see what there is inside if you don't want. On the other side, if you want, you have the possibility once more to put to stack other layers that is coming maybe not from ST. Mm -hmm. Because this is part also, we are not just talking about, oh, I have a digital, war, digital input or an analog input, and then you need to, to be uh, tricky or to do something very, very uh, with high level of expertise to do the job. I give you the board, you have uh, ST offering, but then if you need to go with something else on top, you have the possibility to stack uh, inside the, 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 same, uh, the same offering of uh, our tool. And this is, let me say, consistent to, to what I say also in, in, in the tool availability that is uh, is coming to be available. Yeah. Andrea, it's been a really good discussion today, um, but just before I finish, I, I just want to go back to your ISPU. Um, so what you've been talking about is, uh, in a sense, you know, it's a lot of uh, openness, third party tools, IDE. From your own perspective, are we, what can you tell me about libraries, for example? What, what, what have we got to um, offer users? ISP is quite is something that is quite new in terms of offering. So first, uh, what we are going to offer here is uh, an ISPU tool chain that is basically allow you to translate from uh, what is your programming language to the ISPU um, programming uh, registers, setting, and whatever. So something that will make uh, straightforward for the one who are uh, programmers, the capability to, to go and, uh, and use it. Of course, uh, if you are not, uh, uh, let me say, uh, if you are not keen to develop all the different libraries uh, around uh, the, the, the inertial sensor, in our offering in uh, X-Cube uh, um, ISPU, you have library with accelerometer, gyro, magnetometers, uh, restilt, calibration, ready to go solution. And we have even the possibility in ISPU GitHub to get the tutorials. Mm -hmm. Then, if I'm going even to the extreme, if you are not uh, an AI programmer or whatever, and you want anyway take advantage of ISPU, you have even the offering of what uh, is uh, coming from uh, Nano Edge AI, where there are already possibilities 
in order to go and program AI mm -hmm. inside the AS, ASP with, uh, let me say, the full support that is coming in terms of algorithm and software. So a lot of things that is uh, uh, able to enrich the possibility for everybody to put the hands on. Because at the end, what we need is really to put the hands on the stuff and yeah. to start to play with it. Fantastic. Andrea, it's been great speaking to you today. Um, so much information, a lot happening with ST, a lot happening in the world of MEM sensing. I really do thank you for your time again to join us on Design Spark, and I hope we can talk again real soon. Thank you. Thank you for asking me today. And uh, really, let's play together with the technology. There is a lot to do together. Fantastic. <laughs>